Imam Majid, welcome to the show. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah Khair, Dr. Tariq al Gafari. It's my pleasure to be with you. Welcome. It's so good to see you after it's been a long time. I don't. I think it's been almost two years since we've actually been together. Maybe it was a conference in the Emirates. I can't remember. But Alhamdulillah, it's good to see you, um, Imam Majid. Um, one of the things that I've been wanting to ask you, I, I, you've you've spoken about this before. I know a little bit about it, but I really would like to hear in more details. I would love to learn more about your father, Rahimahullah. Uh, I know that your father uh, is a tremendous influence. First of all, we'd like everyone to know who your father was exactly and how your father's personal situation brought you uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, my father um, was the, uh, the only son among uh, four um, uh, sisters. Uh, um, he is, has brothers who died in infant, in the, where he became the oldest son. Um, and the, he grew up in a village north of Sudan called Rikabia. Mm. And Rikabia is, the, is a tribe that is spread all over Sudan. But originally, their, their father uh, our great grandfather, the original, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, called the founder of the of the tribe. The tribe has a founder, and the main person uh, is the man by name Ulam Allah ibn Aid. Ulam Allah ibn Aid. Hmm. Ulam Allah ibn Aid uh, came from uh, Mecca, hmm. and he was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi uh, from Al Hussein, and he came to Yemen and he established a village there. Uh, still, uh, the village is still there in Yemen. And then he came to Sudan. And his children, one of his children named Rikab, that's what Rikab was named after. Uh, Ulam al ibn Aid is the first person to have established a Quranic school in the north of Sudan. Now there's some people have revived it in the north of Sudan uh, called Khalwat or Amal ibn Ayy. Hmm. Well, my father come from that lineage of uh, people who spread the teaching of the Quran and uh, establish the schools of Quran and so forth. And the, uh, then Ulam al ibn Ayy, the, you know, children spread through Sudan. Therefore they're in the middle of Sudan, they're in the west of Sudan. And some of them went to even Ethiopia. And there's Rikabiya, by the way, in Egypt. Hmm. Uh, yes. And, and there's a Qariya, uh, a, a, a village in Rikabiya, in, in village, in, uh, sorry, in Egypt called Rik Rikabiya. And there's Rikabiya in Iraq also. Okay, mashallah. Yeah, now. But my father, Rahimullah, you know, uh, he always remembered this lineage. He, he would repeat it with me to say, We've been, we've been uh, destined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach people Islam and so forth because of what, uh, what our great grandfather have done. And if my father grew up in this village, uh, which is also I spent time in it, uh, in the village uh, in, in the uh, age, uh, the village doesn't have uh, electricity, it doesn't have running water, there's a well. You take the water from the well and it is on the Nile. Um, and we had uh, really um, uh, had a beautiful, beautiful childhood, uh, remember, very simple, very simple life. You know, uh, when I tried to explain to my children how stress-free, like, first of all, there's, there's uh, nothing, you know, make those people, you know, um, stressed about uh, material life, because material life is very, Simple. They go and they work on the farm, and they grow their own crops. Um, they uh, eat what they they grow, and uh, they grow. And there's there's nothing that they really desire of major cities. Mm. And the morning the morning begins with with fajr. They pray fajr, and then they sit they do al kar, uh, and then until the sun is up, then they go to the farm. And they work until like 10 o'clock and have a meal. They work another <laughs> shift 
and then they come a whole time. Uh, they take a shower, they pray the whole in Jama'a, and they take a nap. The whole city uh, take a nap. Uh, I would like to make sure this is all. Um, the, the whole city take a nap, called Qailula. And then they wake up again, and you know, they, they uh, before uh, Asr, they eat a very light meal, and they go to a uh, farm and work until the time of between Asr and Maghrib. And then they come sunset, and in sunset they they come uh, back to the village, and they have a uh, tea, it's milk, and you know, and they start socializing until Isha time, and and Isha they pray Isha, they do their adkar of uh, at night, and they go to sleep. I have not heard any grudges, hate, uh, you know, fight. You know, they, they, very interesting. Um, they, when they used to have some people have dispute, say two people have dispute over things, over the land or anything like that. How they resolve it? They gather people in the in the, mos, in the masjid uh, and then in the mosque, and then they do adhkar, make dua for this and so forth. And then they ask him afterward. What, what kind of dispute do you have? <laughs> they said, okay, we'll, okay, we'll forgive each other. <laughs> like, that, how they resolve issues. The good life, alhamdulillah. Good life, you know. Um, you know, for my father grew up in, in, in that city and in, in the village and uh, studied the Quran early, uh, early, um, early uh, age. And we they did teach him the basic Maliki Madhab, uh, Al-Akhbari and, uh, you know, Rizal. You know, those... Uh, Basic, Ibn uh, Ashir, you know they, and then he went to uh, he went to Egypt. Went to Egypt. My father has so much love for Egypt, and not saying that because you're Tarak al Gawhari, it's not to better you heard it. But he has so much. Love. He believed that Egypt is is uh, is the land of Awliya. He used to believe that, and and he has that uh, love for for Egypt. Um, and uh, he he studied there, um, you know uh, the 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 pre al azhar uh, mm. school al maahid and those kind of things, and they went to al azhar, and he become uh, you know, top of his uh, classes and so forth, did very well mashallah in al azhar, and then um, again come to Sudan, and in Sudan in many villages who were not Muslims. Um, mm accepted Islam because of him. Um, uh, I'm talking to people who don't know this, they're not Christians, they're not, uh, you know, they don't have any background of uh, any religion hmm. uh, in per se. And some of them just uh, um, interested in to know about religion. My father, uh, he does a lot of social services also provided clothing and so forth. And until he become the, you know, considered like a chief of the scholars in Sudan, he become the the Secretary General of the the, the High Supreme uh, Religious Council called Majlis Al A'la, the Shul He he reached that level, and uh, he used to lead people for Hajj every year. And one of those trip, uh, he felt sick, and then come home and recover a little bit, and then and then we discover that he has kidney failure. Then we took him back to Saudi for treatment for some times, and then. We come to America uh, for treatment, and uh, he passed away in 1990. But, Rahimahullah. Rahimahullah. But uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Tariq al gawhari I want to tell you something about my father. I never heard my father backbite anything I did. MashaAllah. heard my father speak ill of people. Hmm. never heard my father, um, uh, you know, complain about life. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, when he was here in the Washington Hospital Center, a um, female doctor said, I will never in my life, I think, I will see someone like your father again. Because one time he has a fever 104, and mm -hmm. I didn't know about it. And the nurse, when she checked it, checked his temperature, she screamed. She said, oh my God, he's not saying anything. And my father was alert and so forth. And, and I told him that the, the surprise that you're not saying anything, he said, I know they're going to come and check it. Why should I say anything? <laughs> you know, uh, Therefore, he is just as um, a very calm person. Uh, you know, he Jamali, 
that always يعني, uh, people loved him all kind of uh, group of people um, loved him you know in in sudan he didn't uh, he did not uh, you know sign himself to any group of people um, you know but because he wanted to be for everybody but the the, the scholars of the, one of the head of the tariqa qadriya for example in the, uh, in the north of sudan his name is sheikh jali he has so much respect for my father uh, not bless the soul of both of them yeah, I mean, uh, that one used to go to the gathering that how much they received him and then other group as well in in sudan uh, you know all of them have this uh, you know Uh, respect for him because he said that the scholar should should lead uh, not to paralyze mm. yeah so imam majid i knew i knew a little bit about your father but i had no idea that you were from ahlul bayt so ahlan wa sahlan bil asyad i did not know that alhamdulillah so now this explains everything i have not publicly before this is the first time because you asked about my father Allahu Akbar, yani, uh, nasab. I mean, this explains everything, you know, it's genetic, like your father said, uh, mashallah. So y- your father's illness, rahimahullah, brought you to the to, to Washington, D.C., and is That's it true it. that you've just been here since then, right, since the early 90s? Yeah, yeah, my, my father, um, you know, I, I never thought well, I would end up in the United States. My, my, my father was, was sick, and, and people suggested for him to come to, to America, and I, he came to America, and I came with him for treatment. Mm. And um, Subhanallah, the, the 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 three doctors took care of my father. One of them Christian, one of them is Jewish, and one of them is Muslim. Mashallah. Uh, and the the doctor who took care of him, uh, the Muslim doctor, uh, he go back to the roots of my father, loving of Egyptian. He's the Egyptian doctor, Doctor Ahmed Ali, <laughs> uh, who was the surgeon, and he become very close to him, and he is the one who introduced him to the other two doctors. And they become very close to my father. My father was, you know, talking to him. It's very interesting that um, Dr. Cohen, first time in his life, met a Muslim clergy. Hmm. Yes, and my father was, you know, he would ask my father questions, and my father would answer the questions about Islam and Muslims and so forth. And uh, Dr. Kelly, the, the, you know, the Christian doctor. That's the first time I have seen three people from different religion who are not hiding their faith. Hmm taking care of someone who's not feeling well. And I said to myself, well, three doctors from various background can try to heal a man. Maybe those three religions can heal the, if they work together, they can heal humanity. Mm. They incorporate together. Uh, but that that's my first, um, actually first time I met the, um, I work closely with, uh, with the Christian and Jewish doctor. Before my father, uh, passed away in 1990 here. After I was supposed to be the donor at that time that the tissues could not match. They, mm. you, what type have to match, which tissues have to match. Then he had a, a transplant that didn't work out. And then he, um, in 1990, he passed away. In Rahimahullah, rahmatan wa So uh, your father was your, uh, I, I assume your main religious influence growing up absolutely absolutely that we used to memorize my father's speech sometimes when he mm. gave the speech <clears throat> he was a um, great uh, khatib uh, speaker uh, rahimahullah and when he speaks you feel that he spoke from the heart because uh, you know uh, sometimes uh, we'll, he would say we'll ask him what are you going to talk about on friday you say i'm going to talk about this You know, you said the topic. And then when you go to the mosque, you, you speak about something else. <laughs> <laughs> then we asked him that, what happened? Mm. Uh, he said, when I sat down, I looked at people's faces, and I said, those people were not ready for the speech I prepared. I mm. was something else. <laughs> then he spoke something else on the spot. You know, um, it was like that. Um, And uh, he used to say that the, the presence of people has something to do with your speech. That's true, yeah, that's true. <clears throat> Therefore, he, he, will, he will change it based on how he felt at the moment. You know, um, 
And, uh, you know, uh, one of the, uh, you know, things that about, about him, he will, after he give the khutbah, we used to just uh, know that if we're going to wait to go with him, it's going to be a long time before we leave that mosque. Mm. Everyone wants to ask him questions. And... Question, uh, just to talk to him and to be in his presence and so forth and so on. Uh, SubhanAllah, he has a special presence. And now he's the one who, um, you know, taught us, uh, taught me and my brothers, um, the, most of the books of Sharia, but also referred us to other scholars to study uh, of his, his friends. Um, but he, um, in his uh, scholarship, um, he was um, uh, combining fiqh with raqayq. He's always, he talks a lot about the softening of the heart. He talks mm. a lot about the diseases of the heart. Uh, mm. And he has so much love for Imam al-Ghazali. That's why uh, I'm very much attached to Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, uh, hujjat al-Islam, because of that. And now I teach it at the Adam Center now for 10 years, every Monday. MashaAllah. I know. I, I, as a matter of fact, just to interject, Imam al-Ghazali, when I was an undergrad, uh, it's when I discovered Imam al-Ghazali. And the same summer that I discovered Imam al-Ghazali, I discovered you uh, at the Adam Center, always talking about your father, Ahya Alum al-Din and Imam al-Ghazali. So our love for you, Imam Majid, is also, it, it started with Imam al-Ghazali. SubhanAllah. Yeah. I never, I never told you that before, but I was uh, just a young uh, undergrad student. I was like, oh, this guy is great. Imam al-Ghazali is wonderful. How come no one taught us about Imam yeah. al-Ghazali? And then we heard, oh, there's an Imam in Adam you know, in Virginia, and he's teaching the Ghazali stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, we have to go visit him, mashallah. Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. No, no, I, uh, you know, I owed a lot to Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, hujjat al-Islam, anhu, in shaping my thinking my life. Mm. Uh, you know, my father, Rahimullah, he, <clears throat> he introduced me to Ihya al and to the Sheikh that taught me Ihya al <clears throat> and to, excuse me, <clears throat> to Madaj al Salikid in Al Qayyim. And I realized that, um, that the, uh, the scholars who made commentary and summarized Ihya al Madin, all of them realized this is just like a work, like outstanding work that they had to work on it, like in Jawzi, in Qudama, in Haj al Qasidin, in Muqtasam, in Haj al Qasidin. They would have become really believing that this is really the way to go, is uh, to uh, to learn um, the Imam al Ghazali, Rahmatullah, with Allah, methodology of transforming people. So, and you continue to teach the Ahya, correct? Yeah, now every Monday, seven o'clock. Tonight. MashaAllah. Yeah, okay. Non-stop. Non-stop. Many years. Uh, we have not finished the whole uh, five volumes yet. We are, you know, we are now in in that bab. And, and uh, now I teach it on Zoom at uh, seven o'clock. Yeah. MashaAllah. And I think if I'm not mistaken, every book, of the 40 books of the Ahya, I think are translated. Uh, no, no, this, some of them, I was told, like the, the way I'm teaching now, I was told there's no translation for that one. Maybe translate to other languages, to other languages, yes. To English, I'm struggling with this and I want to, anyone to let me know if they... Okay, I'll send you, uh, there's a website that I worked on uh, called Quranic Thought, uh, dot com that is uh, run uh, out of Amman, Jordan, mm. and uh, in the Quranic Thought website, we built the website around the the books of uh, Al Ghazali, Al Razi, uh, Al Siyuti, Ibn mm. Ata'illah, and Imam Al Haddad. And I worked on the Ghazali list, and I remember, maybe I'm wrong, but I remember when I came to list to to research specifically the Ahya. I think every one except maybe one or two of the 40 books of the Ahiyat was translated. Not, not by the same translator and the same publishing house, but I did find them all translated. I'll share oh, it. Oh, mashallah, that, that would be great help because the other, uh, you know, uh, books I found that to be translated, I asked my student 
uh, and they told me that there's no translation of this segment of the yeah. La Quranic thought is is a great project. It's run by the Al Bayt Foundation, and you know which you know well. And yeah. um, uh, I hope one day somebody will put all of the forty books translated, you know, in a box set. Uh, and then, yes, you know, that would be. And be Muslim great. houses can have them. You know, it's uh, yeah. very important. So Imam Majid, I know that you you came, you know, for your father. So you had, you know, something else in mind completely. And uh, by a series of, you know, let's say Qadr, you know, you ended up with the Adam Center. Yes. And, uh, you know, you fast forward a little bit, uh, almost 10 years, and almost overnight, because of 9-11, you become, you know, like America's, one of America's imams. And now everyone wants to know about the Adam Center and what's going on in the Adam Center. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that experience, what was that like? You know, going from working at the mosque to all of a sudden having this international platform and having to answer all these questions and things like that. Yeah, so subhanAllah, the, you know, I always believe in uh, engaging the larger society. Um, I, you know, I used in DC, I used to talk to uh, people from uh, foreign institutes and so forth, even before 9-11 about Islam. And then and Adam Center, they had relationship with, with local officials, <clears throat> law enforcement, and so forth before 9-11, and a very good relationship with the Jewish community and the Christian community. But 9-11 um, uh, was the turning point in Muslim relationship uh, with the larger society, I think, in many ways. Uh, and I remember that uh, the, uh, the second day of 9-11, we went to the mosque. Uh, we, we, at that time, we were renting a place. Um, uh, temporary facility before we uh, build this, uh, mashallah, a big uh, facility here. Um, we went and realized that somebody has uh, sprayed, you know, some kind of graffiti and mm. uh, foul language in our mosque. And and um, Washington Post then wrote an article about it. And it, very interesting uh, that we suspended the school at that day. We have some children in the building. <clears throat> we told them not to come since we have this kind of threat. And when the Washington Post wrote an article about it, uh, next day, uh, the Jewish community, Sikh community, Christian community, came to Adam Center with flowers, mm. big poster. I remember the Jewish community brought a big poster, have the children signing it. And the Sikh community brought brought flowers. I remember the Christian brought checks. Actually, want to uh, repaint the place to pay for it. And that was some amazing uh, solidarity we have seen, the love that we have seen from the larger community. And because of that article, then people come start asking me questions about Islam and Muslims, and you know, it happened that I I become more available to the media to mm. speak. <clears throat> And then uh, after that, a series of interviews about, about this issue. And, uh, and, and then starting to uh, <clears throat> have a relationship with the, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with local government and, and, and you know, uh, federal government to talk about uh, issue concerning Muslim and hate crime and so forth from um, the Department of Justice, FBI, everybody. We talk to them about what Muslims are experiencing and that led to a series of events after that at the Adam Center become a place where people come to learn more about Islam and Muslims and Muslim community. And the community from a small community that I joined them, and by the way, uh, also this is the first time we're gonna say that, this is, this is my 25th year. Uh, Adam Center. <laughs> MashaAllah. Yeah, 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 this uh, actually this coming months MashaAllah, wow. Congratulations, Imam Majid. MashaAllah. 25 years serving in the same community. Wow. Um, alhamdulillah. For uh, when I joined um, um, uh, Adam Center, uh, the, the founders of Adam Center are very visionaries. They really, um, they, from the beginning, they have created kind of an open uh, community and uh, and I remember that um, my uh, my brothers who before me and the leadership, uh, specifically, I want to talk about my brother Wal Khairu, uh, 
brother uh, Murtada Al Khalifa and others mm. uh, who were who were in the leadership, <clears throat> they had the that vision of open society, open communities. Before I joined them, actually, they asked me to help them to pass flyers to the Christian and uh, churches and synagogues and so forth to do an open house. That way before that 1994. Mm. John Adams Center. Therefore, they had that kind of vision of openness. They didn't open because of 9-11. They were very open to begin with to the largest society engaging mm -hmm. in, in, in largest uh, activities with, the, with, with, the, with the, uh, their fellow Americans of people of other faith and so forth. <clears throat> but that, that led to now after 9-11, uh, uh, we have uh, seen uh, the misconception, misunderstanding about Islam. And that brought me to speak to, from evangelical Christians to the Jewish community, to uh, public officials. Uh, that's what, uh, what led to all of that. Imam Ejid, when you, when, when you had that experience uh, right after 9-11 and starting to speak to the media, did you, were you thinking about uh, you know, what would my father do or what would my father say? Did that, did his training and his teachings help you in that regard? Big time. Um, you know, the Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in the hadith, taqillah hayt, taqillah Be conscious of Allah wherever you may be. It's not only in the space, but also in situations. Mm. You have to have God, be God conscious. Whether you are sitting with public officials, whether you're meeting with people of other faith, you have to have God in your mind and your heart. Mm. And my father, the one who taught me this hadith several, several times, and this hadith was his favorite. He gave so much hope to him. Mm. To be conscious of God, wherever you may be. And what I see it has come from. And always do self-evaluation. Where did that went wrong? What I could have said something that I said I should not have said. How can I improve? And should ask other people, give them, have them to give my, their, their feedback into this issue. Before this um, aspect of it is, is, uh, is, is important to me because, uh, because sometimes you may assume that you have done your best and, and by talking to other people, you realize that maybe you should have changed here and there. Mm -hmm. And and then the third thing is treat people, every person, every human being, with dignity and honor. Mm -hmm. That whether you're sitting with the, with the president of the United States, whether you're sitting with um, an average person in the street, anyone who you have access to, anyone who give you opportunity to talk to, treat them with dignity. They can feel your presence if you treat them as human being. Even if they disagree with you completely in your approach, your belief, and everything, they treat them as a human being. Because the Prophet said, Prophet said, الناس, they say the Muslims, every human being. And, and that I learned from my father. My father, Rahimullah, he has Qabul, uh, that people have accepted him in many areas, and, and people who disagree with him, maybe, in his approach. And, mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, they might if we disagree with him in, in, in theologically, uh, talking about people who are not Muslims and others, uh, but but he has presence. People liked him, uh, loved him because he said to me, uh, "You're presenting you're presenting the prophetic teaching." The Prophet spoke to every human being, every human being. He gave them a chance <clears throat> and uh, appealed to people conscious. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a goodness in every human being, no matter. How bad that person in, my, in your eyes may look like, but in the eyes of Allah, you never know. It's a potential wali. It's a potential wali. Mm -hmm. Potential. You know? Uh, <clears throat> therefore, that um, my father then, uh, oh. there's something very interesting that uh, one time him and I were crossing the street in Saudi. We were in Jeddah. We were walking, crossing the street. And my father um, held my hand and said, I want to tell you something. Uh, and, you know? I, you know, after we cross the seat, he, I remember he stood, you know, uh, said, he used to walk, you know, sometime in the morning and so forth. Then he held my hand and actually, the, after we come from out of a meeting, I think we went to visit some people and I said, wow, this is a big gathering and so forth. Then he said to me, listen, 
I want to give you an advice. And he said, that that's way before I came to the United States. And uh, you know, as teenagers, he said to me, God might give you an opportunity to meet with people of influence, but you have to remember a few things about them, about those people you're gonna meet with. You have to remember every human being who has a title to give them the title that humanity has, people have given them. Don't respect anyone. You know, mm. call people with that title. But remember, don't enlarge a person more than he should in, in your mind, in your heart. Mm. Every human being gonna die, no matter how long they live and how powerful they are. They get sick, they need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They eat, they sleep, and they will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the judgment. Barefoot, naked. Just remember that so that it, it, the, the presence of being present in any person does not take away from you that reality. Yeah. But speak to everyone with dignity and respect, no matter how much you disagree with him. And he reminded me later, after this nasiha, later one time he reminded me, he said, don't speak harsh to anyone. Even Allah Almighty said to Musa السلام, when he spoke to Pharaoh, yeah. speak softly to, to yeah. Pharaoh, you know. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala said, he might, perhaps he might be reminded and might change his mind. But Allah knew that Pharaoh was not gonna accept Islam. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yet he told Musa, for he 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 told me that. And one of the things that I think, uh, you know, as my father voice always in my head, is you know, he always repeated the word humility. Yeah. Do not don't let it get to your head, as you become known, uh, you know, don't let it get to your head. And that's why I tell to anyone who is in public eye, you have to do few things to stay grounded. Do your awrad, your dhikr. If you don't have a word, don't do this. Pray your tahajjud at night. Visit the sick. Mm. Bury the dead. Mm. And have your own support system, somebody you talk to. Mm. Somebody you talk to, give you sincere advice. If you don't have that, don't do this kind of thing. Don't be in any public eye. I, I love this advice, Imam Majid. MashaAllah, this is, and what you're saying is almost verbatim all, what all my teachers said to me in you know, different uh, scenarios. Uh, MashaAllah. So you were ready, alhamdulillah, that, for that uh, opportunity. I mean, I, I know a lot of people were given the opportunity around 9 11, uh, and there were many talking heads, and you know, most of those people we don't even know where they are today. Uh, and there are a few that remain, and you're one of those voices, mashallah, and Adam Center's, you know, uh, has grown, you know, exponentially. Uh, I was at Adam Center, I think, right before COVID, and I was, I was shocked. I was like, man, this place just keeps growing. Every time I come, there's a new, mashallah, a new wing or a new thing, mashallah. Very, very, you know, my, my kids were, were very impressed. Imam Major, one of the things that you said uh, about the vandalism episode and, and how the interfaith community came out, a lot of, a lot of my listeners... Are not are not necessarily in America, and uh, I think that some of the, especially people that are not used to hearing that, might not understand the role that interfaith work plays in a mosque in America. Um, you know, there are some weeks where I think that's all I do. Uh, some, there are some weeks where I spend more time at the, the local church or synagogue than I do at my own masjid. You know, because there's meetings and things like that. And I know that you do this at a at, a, at an even bigger level. And I, I, I would love for people to hear you comment and talk about that. What, what kind of role that play? People might find that very strange. Like, why would the local church and synagogue and Sikh community come and, you know, offer to help repaint the mosque? For us, we're, I think we've gotten used to that. That that's mm -hmm. just like if there was a synagogue that there was graffiti, we would go and we would help to clean yeah. it. And, but I think some people listening might not, not be familiar with that at all. Uh, and I, if you can address that a little bit for us and, and talk a little bit about the importance of that type of work in running a mosque in America. Yeah, uh, subhanAllah, you know, the mosque exists in a community. And a community is not only Muslim community, but is a Christian community, Jewish community, and other 
people other faith. For you, your neighbors, the neighbor of the masjid, of the mosque, are not necessarily all Muslims. Sure. Therefore, you have to, from the Islamic perspective, you have to be good to your neighbors. You have to get to know your neighbors. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that most of the masjid, the mosques in America, in the 70s and the 80s, it started in churches. Mm, that's true. Churches are the one who opened the door for people to pray Jummah. Mm. It's an amazing experience. Now our Adam Center has two branches. Uh, both of them are in synagogues. Two branches are in synagogues. Mm. Uh, and now, just now, the Ashburn Mosque, Alhamdulillah, we built our own mosque. But he, for years that uh, we share the same facilities, uh, with the with with the synagogue, mm. and in Reston, uh, still our Juma is in the synagogue. Mm. We used mm. to be in the church, and that the, that church was uh, remodeled or rebuilt or something, at that time. And then the Jewish uh, community offered to host us in mm. in the synagogue um, for for years, and not only for the for Juma, but also for Tarawih. For I asked the brother, what did you pray Taraweeh today? He said, I prayed in synagogue, in the synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> I prayed my Jummah in the synagogue. Yeah. Yeah, that is a unique relationship uh, in, in America. But I would like just to say that, you know, um, the I found many people in America who are genuinely sincere about, you know, relationship with other people, they wanted to see them flourish. They want to see them be protected. Like when when the Muslim ban issues came in, uh, come up and something like that, it majority of people at the airports, they were not Muslims. Yeah. The people of other faith. Um, today, I work with the uh, evangelical Christians. We created something called Multi-Faith Neighborhood Network uh, with evangelical Christian and Jewish. We are in 25 cities. Now we're gonna our approach to go to fifty cities. What we do? We bring the uh, a rabbi, an imam, and a pastor from major cities, and we gather them together as a group, and we have three days retreat for them to go to know uh, get to know one another. Mm. And they have to by the, by the end of the retreat, they have to commit themselves to five things. Mm. Number one, to visit each other in home in their home, mm. you know, to get to know the families. Number two, to have the gathering of communities together in social gathering to create that understanding. Number three, they have to commit to a, a local project mm. so they can do together. And number four, they have to stand for each other. If a mosque been attacked, people stand for it, the church or synagogue, uh, and addressing the issue of bullying in public school. And number five, to create a network in time of emergency and so forth to be able, able to respond to it together. Therefore, we, we do this retreat, and those three imams, uh, three uh, clergies, we call them three amigos, uh, they, have to <laughs> they have to go and get, um, each one of them have to get a nine imams, nine pastors, nine rabbi in, the, uh, in that city. Mm -hmm. And we do the retreat. We take those three people, become the leader. We do a retreat in the city because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a network that goes to the grassroots levels. And guess what? In places there uh, they were attack uh, uh, or intimidation done by some Christian right wing group in Arizona part of this network that we had they go and supported the Muslims against those people who tried to intimidate them and therefore changing people's mind about one another and creating what we call resilience community mm. uh, because it you know it's one of the things that I know you're good at it mashallah you are part of a coexistence. You know, yeah, this, yeah, and and, and 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 this this our 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 really uh, um, uh, you know uh, slogan that we we have to coexist, and therefore we teach people now we develop actual program for coexistence mm. and how people can live together in a community and create a resilience community against hate and bigotry. So it's like the new Wathiqat al Madina, exactly, uh, which is it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I want people to hear that and, and know. I love how you said, you know, the mosque is in a community, but the community is not all Muslim. Yes. Uh, and, you know, we deal with, like you, with, with issues of zoning. Uh, you know, of course, the Friday prayer and the Eid prayers, having to respect, you know, the, the traffic that we generate and the parking situation that we have. 
and having people respect you know where they park their cars um and the noise level and you know our mosque is, is in a neighborhood it's a little bit different so uh we we, we actually are in a neighborhood so we, mm. we the first thing that we did is we made sure we met with all of the neighbors who are all non-muslim mm. uh to make sure everyone was comfortable and as a matter of fact the neighbors became so comfortable that they were the ones that advocated with the zoning department when we had some troubles on different zoning permits. They helped us. You know, they said, no, we want these people here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, alhamdulillah, that's, that's important. Because, you know, in the Muslim world, the mosque is not necessarily like that. The mosque is, and you go, you pray, and then khalas, it, it, it closes after prayer. Um, because the majority of the country, like in Sudan or, or in Egypt, is, is Muslim. But in the West, or in, when we're a minority, it's very different. The mosque has a very different role. It's almost very similar to the role of the mosque in the time of the Prophet, وسلم, where everything happens through the masjid. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, Absolutely. You know, that's great. Absolutely. And, and not only that, you have people who will advocate for your mosque to be built. And they will, you know, stand against those who oppose your mosque. And, and sometimes in some places where there's prejudice, the federal government, comes in the Department of Justice and says that's unfair decision that this the board have made about mm -hmm. the mosque and so forth. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Muslims across the United States have established relationship with their with, with their fellow Americans who are non-Muslims, especially in the process of establishing the mosque or the school, Muslim school. Now, you may imagine one of the questions I like to ask uh, many of my guests is, you know, you came to America in the '90s. And I remember, you know, privately, you've shared with me stories of your father, Rahimahullah, interacting with people at the Islamic Center in Washington. And, you know, when there used to be fights in the mosque and things like that. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on what was Islam in America like then compared to how you find it now? You know, what, what, what is good and what, what do we still have to work on in these last, you know, several decades that you've witnessed Islam in this country or Islam in the West, even in general? Yeah, I came in the 80s, by the way. Oh, 80s, okay. But, but I started working there in the DC in, in the 90s. But in, uh, my father passed away in 1990. But I came in the 80s, um, end of the 80s. Um, yeah, it's a big difference. First of all, the, you remember the Islamic Center, Washington DC used to be the mosque. Place. That's, that's where you go, yeah. Yes, in the area. Uh, <clears throat> and the second mosque was MCC, actually. In, in yeah, the Silver Spring, Maryland, yeah. The Silver <laughs> Spring, Maryland. And, and now, Arabs alone have seven branches. MashaAllah. <laughs> Imagine that. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, there's tremendous um, growth in number of mosques being built in America. That's mm -hmm. number one. And number two, also uh, the, the diversity of of thoughts and ideas in Muslim in America have increased. Uh, some some of it positive, sometimes negative, mm -hmm. you know. But 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 there's a more diversity um, now, um, and also uh, the uh, the growth of uh, Islamic schools, uh, you know, across America, more Islamic schools as the second, third, fourth generation uh, Muslims having their own children now, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, the, therefore, the, the, the numbers of uh, Islamic schools across the nation have increased. Also, I can see that Muslims become more politically active than ever before. Uh, matter of fact, uh, as we speak, you have three members of uh, the Congress uh, who are Muslims. Um, and we have uh, the Attorney General um, in, in the Minnesota. Uh, Keith Ellison, the first Muslim uh, Attorney General of the state. And we have locally here, we have uh, in our uh, county, the Attorney General of the county, she's Muslim. And many uh, Muslims in the school board, uh, many Muslims uh, in the local government. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, that, that is uh, a big shift, a big change um, uh, from what I have experienced in the beginning coming to the United States. The other thing is that the interfaith coalitions that Muslim has across the United States, every major city, Muslims work with their fellow Americans, whether Muslims and uh, whether they're Christians or Jewish or Hindus or Buddhists, 
and issue that concern them in that local community. That's okay. something new also that I have not seen in the beginning. Although I would like to say there's pioneers in this uh, issue that uh, I remember when I was in DC, uh, I know that Dr. Said Muhammad Said and his wife <laughs> will go to the churches and synagogue and you speak to um, the, you know, to people about Islam and share, uh, you know, Muslim values. But, but that is one aspect. The other thing is the biggest change, something called social media. Yeah. That's something positive or something negative. Now, Muslims, you know, every person can, you know, post whatever you want to post mm -hmm. and every kind of opinion about every human being and everyone can say anything you want to say. Therefore, that, that kind of face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, discussions have been absent and and in social media, the posts uh, uh, sometimes are really um, not positive. Sometimes that that has created tension. Although now I can see also ac access to knowledge that many people now, like you, what you're doing now, you know, that people hear lectures and so forth that uh, Dr. Tariq Al Gahori can speak to thousands of people from his place. You know, that is uh, uh, also a new reality. And also the interest of many young people studying Arabic language. This is like unheard of. Like people spend a whole year studying Arabic language, born and raised in America. Uh, that is something very, very, very positive. Uh, and also so many young people who seriously studying Islam and so forth and so on. Um, that's uh, one thing, but also pluralization unfortunately uh through in the social media sometimes tension between muslims uh happened through the uh, social media but there's a big big change and uh, from the 80s to the to 20s so you know you, you reminded me of something important in my measured which is uh, the, you know coming back to the importance of the message and i find and i agree with everything that you said and and of course you you have been doing what you're doing much longer than, than I have. When you came uh, to America, I, I was probably still in uh, junior high school or, or now it's called middle school. I don't know what, what it, but when I was, when I was growing up, it was called junior high school. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed over the years myself is that the Masajid, you know, people that are very pol polar and people that are on the fringe or, or whatever spectrum uh, they don't really hang around the mosque long term. And uh, in other words, the masjid is, I think, is even more important now than it was when I was growing up. The, the masjid is, you know, a place of healing and or it should be a place of healing and a place where people can come together. Uh, and people that have extreme views, oftentimes I find are not consistent. Yet yeah. They'll show up and, and they'll create fitna, but then they'll leave. Yeah. Uh, and then it's just families are, are the ones that remain. You know, in the mosque that I grew up in, same founding families, now their kids and their grandkids are now at, at the mosque. So I think that also speaks to the importance of the mosque, you know, in America and, or in the West in general, and, and, and needing to fortify our message even more, I think is important. Absolutely. I think that I agree with you 100%. The mosque is, is the base, is, 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 the, is the anchor point. It is the, the, the glue that brings people together because the, 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 the mosque in, in America is not just a place of, to pray uh, for prayers, but it's a place where you should send your children for Sunday schools, is where the people of other faith come to know about Islam, where the public official come and ask him for votes, actually, <laughs> in our mosque, they always come and talk to us in, in Adam Center, is where the um, counseling take place, uh, issue of mental health, the, we have an Adam's 11 counselors doing mental health counseling, uh, although they do from their offices, but Adam coordinate that social services. People come for, uh, they couldn't pay their rent or they have any financial difficulty to come to the mosque. Uh, all of this, uh, they come to the youth, come to the masjid to play. We have a basketball court in yeah. the masjid. Yeah. Um, therefore, the, 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 it is a center. Yeah. The mosque is a center of activities and community center where people also come for other uh, needs uh, to the masjid. And our masjid, for example, has a, uh, one of our branches have a, a community clinic, which is open for Muslim and non-Muslims, uh, people of other faiths. And subhanAllah, believe it or not, this pandemic, we have 
uh, provide vaccine to 20,000 people wow, to our sure. clinic and to almost 20,000 people vaccinated through Adam Center. Wow. And we, yeah, we collaborated with the, with the synagogue, with the churches and so forth, but we vaccinated people every week and we opened the mosque inside Adam Center uh, for several weekends. Uh, we provided uh, vaccine in the main center and the branches. Mm -hmm. And we took also the vaccine to other masajid that we, we took the clinic and so forth to, to the local the other mosque in Virginia to vaccinate them. Therefore, um, this, 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 there's no masjid in, you know, uh, that I, I, in Sudan that I heard of that they do vaccine or do this yeah. kind of activities. Therefore, that's the role of the masjid in America. It's more than just a place of uh, prayer, but it's a place of service as well. Just to underscore that, when I was telling my younger son that we're going to speak today, I said, you know, Imam Majid, Imam of Adam Center, and he said, the one with the big basketball court, that's all he remembers. Is that we, <laughs> we went one time for something. Of course, he didn't attend with me. The minute he walked in and he saw the basketball court, he left me and he played, you know, all night long and he had a good time. And so he, that's all he remembers. It's the mosque with the basketball Even though our mosque has a basketball court too, but still, that's, mashallah, what he, he remembers. And I mean, that's happy. It's a, it's, I'm happy that, that that's how our kids grow up. You know, the mosque was not like that for me growing up. It was just small. Uh, of course, later on, it expanded. So, uh, you know, alhamdulillah. And, uh, you know, the mosque for us in the West is very dynamic, as you, as you mentioned. And, um, and even though it's different than the mosques in Muslim-majority countries, I think that the mosque in America m mimics the prophetic model more. Exactly. And, and that's what gets me excited, I think. And, and I wanted Absolutely. people to, to know about that. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, Imam Majid, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I know you're super busy. And uh, you. first of all, thank you so much for giving me all the time that you've, you've given me this thank morning. Thank you. I, I, I feel great being with you. I miss you. I miss you too, Imam Majid. And uh, uh, I, I usually ask my guests to end with a piece of advice. But you gave me some good advice in the middle about... Uh, the weird and the tahajjud and and having a support network. So I'm gonna I'm gonna re-listen to that because sometimes I find myself overwhelmed, uh, especially when I counsel people. It's very hard to like hear people's problems and you, you sort of carry that a little bit. Yes. But what I want to ask you at the end is I want your thoughts on the future. Uh, where do you think? You know, we've talked a lot about where we've come from and how things are now. Where do you see? the community, specifically you know, the, the North American community, or even just the community in the Washington, D.C. area, where do you see us in the next five, 10 years? Uh, you know, if you can project out, how do you see things unfolding? Um, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, usually, and, and I would like to just to continue to be optimistic. I would say that I, I see that many young people excited about learning of Islam. I see that more of Muslims involved in civic engagement and public uh, service. I see that um, our uh, communities, um, you know, go to the next level in, in building institutions, not only masajid and schools, but building other institutions. And I am very optimistic that um, American Muslims uh, will have, uh, establish a relationship or continue to increase the relationship positively with the larger society and, and Islam and Muslim become part of um, American social fabric in a way that I have not seen before uh, because of the openness of America to Islam and because of the constitution that granted everyone religious freedom. And I do believe that there's a lot of potential in building those uh, and growing those relationships. Inshallah. That's a good note to, to end on, uh, to being optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Imam Majid, for that very much. Uh, and uh, ho hopefully we can get together soon now that we're vaccinated. No, inshallah, we can get together soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.